Hello, welcome. All right, so let me get the names down as usual. All right. Uh, I hope you guys did well on your first test. And now we're uh, starting a, a clean slate with the next four subjects. Uh, we're going to do the War for Independence. We're going to do the Articles of Confederation, uh, the Constitution, uh, the first three administrations, generically entitled Great Man History of the Early Republic. And um, that might be five, actually. And then uh, the War of 1812. And then we have test two. So I will put test two up as well uh, for you to uh, have plenty of time to look at the questions. We'll take a look at it right now, actually, um, as far as the questions pertaining to the war for independence. Some people believe that we had a bona fide revolution, that you had a, a fundamental 180 degree change uh, socially, politically, and economically, and uh, argue for a revolution. And some people, uh, as I do, I play it safe and, and just merely call it a war for independence uh, against uh, the British or, or the English. As of 1707, it was that England was under Great Britain with Scotland and Northern Ireland and, um, and the United States and Australia. So at any rate, um, are there any questions? Any questions at all? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself, should you have any. All right. So let's take a look here. We have here, which of the following was not mentioned as commonly cited by historians as relevant context to the war for independence? Number two, historians who interpret the war for independence from Great Britain as a fight to maintain political powers and economic rights that the colonists had already accumulated due to poor enforcement of English laws are said to adhere to what type of thesis? Uh, Bernard Balin and his thesis, I need you to know that. Uh, number four, ask a question about the enlightenment and natural rights. Number five, about the great awakening. Uh, number six, obviously uh, to some historians, uh, highly relevant to the war for independence. Uh, Scottish and English libertarianism, uh, we have that as number six. Uh, Joseph Ellis as number seven. Uh, his, his book and his thesis on George Washington and his biography. And we, uh, all this is pretty much without exception uh, found in the handout. Number eight, Howard Zinn and his book, his thesis on war for independence. And then number nine, that is up to you. Um, hopefully you will have had uh, obtained your uh, textbooks by the time test two comes around. Uh, it, it's still a while ahead um, uh, and you could uh, you could find that from the textbook, okay? But nothing, no curveballs will be thrown. I'll uh, put this te these test questions up and let you familiarize yourself with them, okay? Also, you are next on my list uh, in catching up on the uh, uh, catching up completely on the uh, on correction uh, papers. I've done um, all four uh, at, at my other school, and um, and so I'm I, I will do that shortly. I will finish the first four uh, assignments for you shortly as well. Okay, and so um, yeah, so. What I want to do is I want to go back to the assignment. 
All right. So in this introduction, uh, I try to give uh, the data, just a general rundown of the data that oftentimes is found to be relevant um, for the war for independence. Because remember, right, if you adhere to court history, right, whereby, you know, good patriotic American history, then oftentimes you adhere to the notion of American exceptionalism, that we're a special, unique country, and we were born on lofty ideals, right? And so hence, you're going to adhere to almost ideological causation, uh, where you're going to believe that beliefs uh, triggered uh, this, a change of beliefs triggered this movement, uh, triggered our independence, all right? And we're going to see uh, Bernard Balin's thesis on just that, all right? But then if you're more of a conflict historian or a Marxist historian like um, Howard Zinn, then you're going to look at economics. You're going to look at possible self-interest. You're going to look at conflict um, and drama of more of a, of a base quality. Uh, you're looking for uh, avarice or greed, uh, uh, power plays, et cetera. So you're going to look for different types of data and what you're going to believe, right, is, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. And so at any rate, what are some of the things that are considered uh, that you'll find in this introduction uh, to be relevant to uh, the war for independence very often, at least, uh, amongst many historians? All right. Uh, a, a popular one when I went to school in the 90s was uh, Gordon S. Wood, uh, W-O-O-D. Um, he was a, a, a pretty popular, well-embraced uh, American historian on the war for independence. And he contends, as, in, as uh, evident in the title of some of his books, that we did have a bona fide revolution, which is argumentative. All right. So what are some of the things that, that, that we probably need to consider going into this, uh, this war? Uh, for one, right? is the British fought uh, the French and Indian War or the Seven Years War against France. And in so doing, they contended that they were fighting at least partially, not only for hegemony or domination or sovereignty over the North American continent uh, in rivalry with France, but also that they were doing it for our good, that they were going to, for one, uh, secure greater liberties for American colonists than the French would have had done um, had the French won the French and Indian War. So they contended, right, that uh, George III, the King of England, the young King of England uh, during the war, uh, contended that American subjects, as he called us, um, enjoy more rights and freedoms uh, than any subjects in the, on the face of the earth. Uh, the subjects of, of Great Britain. And um, secondly, uh, the British are going to contend that they are going to keep the, uh, the frontier, uh, the western periphery of the 13 original colonies, uh, open for future American infiltration uh, to come upon and settle on the western land. And they contended that the French and moving, uh, making their moves along the Mississippi River and on the Ohio Valley, uh, we're pushing Americans eastwardly back to the coast, and we're going to keep that from happening. So hence, it was in the best interest of the American subjects uh, to, um, to fight for Britain and to hope that, that Britain win uh, against France. However, what we see in the textbook, and you see uh, with Howard Zinn and other historians, is they're going to contend that there is a lot of evidence for very lukewarm uh, passion on behalf of American subjects here under Great Britain in the 13 colonies uh, during and for uh, the, uh, the war against, between England and France. Uh, so, for instance, when they asked for the allotments of money, and when they asked for allotments of volunteers from the colonial assemblies, the colonial assemblies, almost without exception, failed uh, to bring about the amount of money uh, asked and the number of men um, 
uh, asked as well by Great Britain uh, to um, to fight uh, uh, against the French. You also have clear evidence of American defiance of navigation laws by Parliament uh, back in England. And the navigation laws were part of the English mercantilist economic economy and system, uh, whereby, remember, under mercantilism, unlike capitalism, uh, there's the notion underlying it that, that resources are finite and that the government has the right to dictate uh, who gets what opportunities uh, to those resources. So it's not an open, free, capitalistic economy by any means. And they were unapologetic about it. And remember, England was not anomalous. It was not out of the ordinary. Uh, most, um, you know, uh, 16 and in the 16 and 1700s, uh, most European monarchs and parliaments uh, were for a mercantilist economy. So they would grant monopolies to certain parties and certain individuals on certain commodities, especially the big money makers like slavery. Uh, they they uh, at least tried at different times to to grant just simply monopolies for slave trading, uh, for uh, sugar and tobacco, uh, etc. They also uh, were unapologetic about the fact that they wanted the colonies uh, to they they didn't they didn't pretend that they ever wanted the colonies to live in a symbiotic relationship uh, with the mother country. Because after all, they were colonies, right? They, they needed to know their place. So hence, they wanted to get raw materials from the colonies, and they wanted to sell their finished products back to the colonies. So they wanted the raw materials and the markets from their economies, uh, from their colonies' economies. And they, um, they didn't want their colonies to become self-sufficient and um, you know, develop everything that they needed for themselves and not be in economic need of the mother country. And I know that's, that sounds unjust uh, from the political tradition and the rhetoric that we've been brought up with here in America about equality of opportunity and meritocracy and freedom. Uh, but it just, it was a different time period uh, in the 16 and 1700s. So at any rate, uh, you have all those factors going in and then you also have the, uh, you know, uh, you, it wasn't just a monolithic entity, uh, the, the, the 13 colonies. The colonies were fighting with one another uh, off and on. Uh, and within the colonies, you always had feuds and conflict of interest and so forth um, within the colonies as well. So for instance, when you look at the colonial setup of the governments, uh, you had the legislators, right? And they, they were comprised of a lower branch of assemblymen, and the assemblymen were fellow colonists who were elected into office uh, to pass laws, etc. But they also had royal councils, uh, at least in nine of the 13 colonies, and royal colonies. Um, the royal council were handpicked by the governor, and they had powers and checks over the assemblies. And so they were not property elected. They didn't pretend to be such. Uh, they, they went by uh, some oftentimes nepotism or favoritism and also by bloodline. Uh, because remember England, and then this was the norm at that time, had a formal aristocracy. Remember aristoi means the best in Greek, uh, a formal uh, you know, entity of people who uh, by virtue of their last names and their bloodline, were entitled to certain privileges and powers that other people were not. They oftentimes were granted monopolies. They oftentimes engaged in graft uh, from inside information and buy land in the Ohio Valley and other areas uh, unbeknownst to the common person. Uh, they oftentimes were granted positions at the Royal Council when the, the common American colonists didn't have a prayer to be chosen as councilmen because they were few in number as well in each of the colonies. And then you had governors, and nine of the 13 governors were appointed uh, by the British government. And so, um, you know, not necessarily in, uh, incredibly by today's standards democratic, right, uh, of the people, 
uh, but that's the way it was. That was the norm. As a matter of fact, that might even have been relative to other countries, not too bad uh, as far as kind of a mixed government and the, the people having at least a voice of one of the three major uh, positions at the colonial levels or, or what we would call later the state levels, right? And so uh, you had that going on. But then you also had, uh, notice I said nine of the 13, you also had uh, proprietary colonies. And in those proprietary colonies, uh, you had, uh, you know, uh, Pennsylvania, although that eventually ceased, uh, Maryland and, um, and Rhode Island. Um, they, uh, they had their own rules, they had their own uh, system, but their systems were relatively democratic. Uh, they, um, they allowed the governor to be elected instead of handpicked by the crown. In uh, uh, um, gosh, by the time that this happened, I believe this was happening. Now oh, I should know that of which of those three colonies, but at any rate, uh, it, it varied. Okay, the, the form of government uh, was the same as far as a governor, a royal council, and an assembly, uh, but it varied. And some of the colonies, like in Massachusetts Bay, um, they actually, um, in Massachusetts, they, they elected their own uh, governor. So at any rate, um, you, you have some, some ambiguity. Everything was, was complex. Uh, looking at the British government, right? You had the, the king and the privy council, and they made certain key decisions, but they were already by this time sharing power uh, with parliament, uh, because of course you had had from 1642 to 1649, the English Civil War. And when Charles I, uh, in the estimation of parliament led autocratically, uh, they started a civil war against him and they beat him and had him executed. And William and Mary uh, ended up signing their pledge to Parliament and becoming the next crowns uh, of England. And so you have that contention between Parliament and the crown and the, and the, and the cabinet of the crown, like the Privy Council. And um, you also had uh, uh, at least uh, two major political parties. You had the Whigs, W-H-I-G-S, and the Tories, T-O-R-I-E-S. And the Tories tended, it didn't always bifurcate so neatly, but oftentimes by the time of the War for Independence um, or prior to it, uh, the Whigs tended to have those who sympathized with the colonies. And, and uh, the Whigs were for having uh, greater uh, checks against the king or queen uh, of England. They wanted stronger parliamentary rule and they wanted to err on the side of democratic evolution. They wanted uh, the, the republic, if you would call that, the, or, or constitutional monarchy of, of England uh, to gravitate in a more democratic uh, direction. And the Tories were conservatives. And oftentimes the Tories felt as if the American colonists uh, needed to be put in their place. Like I said, it wasn't always that neat, that difference between the two, uh, but oftentimes that did seem to happen, it seems. Uh, so uh, you have that part of the, of the context going on. And then you also have uh, English citizenship. You know, they called it subjectship. Uh, at this time, and it wasn't even clear, you know, what exactly the rights of citizenship or subjectship sh should and ought to entail. Uh, so, for instance, it's like going back to Rome. Uh, they had at least three levels of citizenship in Rome. Uh, sometimes you just had basic uh, liberty and economic autonomy uh, to get a job, whatever job you could get, uh, earn wages, buy property, uh, retain your property. Uh, you had that basic right for non-slaves in Rome. And then the next level, you had protection under the Lex Hortensia or the Roman constitution. And you had uh, protection of the law uh, on your side. So you can go to that level. 
And then you also had those who uh, could politically participate, what we call suffrage um, in politics and vote, run for office <clears throat> and actually help govern. That was an, another higher level. And so Rome is kind of an example of that because England is an historical um, amalgamation of Rome that fell and the Germanic tribes of the Angles and Saxons that took over at the fall of Britannia, of, of, of Roman England. And so uh, England is, has a Germanic and Roman past and it, it's, its notion of common law is just dizzying. Uh, it, it, it just, it confuses me personally. The more I try to read into it, um, it, it it's complex to say the least. Um, they go oftentimes by precedent, uh, uh, laws that are passed by parliament, um, uh, decrees that are passed by the crown and the privy council, um, and decisions made by judges. And so looking at England itself, you had a lot of people in England who did not have the right of suffrage, of, of electing people into office and running for office uh, still in the 1770s. And so the same is, is the case similarly with the American colonies. Uh, you know, it, it was by no means an automatic axiom that everyone, you know, just took for granted that moving to the colonies, Americans would enjoy all the rights of subjectship under England. And then, you know, you had different um, uh, contracts and, and treaties uh, that were, that are charters that were given in all the different colonies oftentimes at different time periods under different circumstances and by different crowns. And in some, they were clear and stated the people in Massachusetts shall enjoy all the full rights of citizenship, of subjectship uh, in, in, um, in the new world as they would in, have enjoyed back in England. Uh, they did not all have that promise in the charters. So, and then some decisions uh, went by bloodline, uh, the, the juice sanguinis, uh, whereby if you uh, came from an English father, uh, you were automatically given the rights of subjectship on account of your father. But in some cases, it was a matter of where you were born, the just solely. And um, so you had to have been born in the realms of England uh, but even in the realms, it got confusing uh, because there were cases of people who were Scots. When Scotland was taken over and formally annexed in 1707 into Great Britain, uh, okay, what about Scots who were non-English ethnically and nationally, uh, but now Scotland is formally under Great Britain, under England's flag? Uh, are they subjects? And to what extent? Uh, to the full extent? or just partial extent. And this is just fascinating to me, but it just adds to all the complexity uh, that's going on uh, uh, leading into this war for independence. But going back to the colonies themselves, uh, some of the assemblymen uh, were not doing their jobs. And uh, you had complaints from the poor and from the people who, especially in the Western periphery of the 13 colonies, who felt like their elected assemblymen were not doing their job when it came to their needs and their political voice on the Western periphery of the states. And so you had complaints against their own elected reps uh, that went above the head of the reps and went directly to the governors and to the royal councils, um, et cetera. So the Americans were not united going into the war for independence themselves. Um, they fought over, as often happens, over a variety of political issues. Uh, at this time, they were also fighting over uh, the, uh, the royal colonies again, nine of the 13 had an established church and state relationship and they had the Anglican or English church. 
and Anglican clergy had certain privileges and certain monopolies, like for instance, with tobacco, um, that was very frustrating to a lot of the other colonists. And so there was resentment toward their Anglican leaders about that. And so you have all kinds of issues uh, that may or may not, to whatever extent uh, it's argumentative, uh, ought to be considered relevant uh, to what's going on. And then also you had population explosion and population um, uh, mobility at this time. Uh, in the early to mid 1700s, for whatever reasons I don't personally recall, uh, the population in the colonies uh, exploded. And so now England has to face, uh, you know, issues that, that are, uh, you know, um, congruent with, uh, you know, or an adjunct to that issue of, of, of greater number of people. You have issues of crime. You have issues of poverty and a growing gap between the rich and the poor. You have issues of urbanization, of more people moving into the cities and then swelling and issues that can come from that. You also have um, the opposite of urbanization. You have many people moving out of the cities and moving into the Western frontier areas. Um, and then in moving into the Western frontier areas, oftentimes they immediately wanted to be represented by one of their own in the assembly. And so they fought with their own official assembly. And they also fought with Native Americans whose land uh, they were intruding upon. And so you have all these issues that are going on uh, leading up to the war for independence. And then in addition to that, you have ideological movements, right? Movements of ideas that percolated throughout the colonies uh, in one manner or another. And when I say in one manner or another, oftentimes through the written word, uh, oftentimes through the spoken word. And so, for instance, the French Enlightenment of the 1740s. Uh, with the Enlightenment, we're going to go over some of the ideas that were big and prevalent amidst that Enlightenment. And by and large, right, it was a protest against the status quo. Uh, they wanted to change uh, what they considered to be the Ansan regime, the old school, the old regime and way of doing things. Uh, in particular, after the French Revolution, uh, the, the world set up the governments and societies of Western Europe as they looked, as in France, prior to the French Revolution. And they were against that. They wanted, um, they wanted change. And they wanted change, of course, in their minds to, for the better. And that seemed to be synonymous with uh, greater rights for the people. Uh, less institutional sway and, and, and dominance of the church and of certain government positions and leaders, et cetera. And so, uh, and also more autonomy or, or liberty and, and independence for the individual and basic human rights uh, to be protected uh, for him or her. So at any rate, you have the Great Awakening, and we're going to get more into the details of that soon. You have Scottish Libertarian Movement. And remember with the Libertarians, like uh, government don't tread on me, uh, the notion that, you know, you want government to stay as small and unobtrusive into your life as possible. You have a, a, a strong distrust of government, a strong distrust of putting human beings in a position with much power. Uh, the term they oftentimes used at that time was arbitrary power, is what you did not want uh, power to do as they please, right? Um, and so uh, you have that. You also have an, emo uh, an emotional, uh, a religious great awakening. And the great awakening was rather anti-institutional. It was against particularly the Anglican church and contending that the Anglican Church had become too political, too secular, uh, too, too worldly, too much of the world. And they wanted it to return to its spiritual roots. And they, they fought for the rights of the parishioners, the common um, English Christians, uh, by way of, of giving them uh, certain rights and autonomy from the Anglican clergy. 
So you have that movement going on as well. And so, you know, a lot going on as far as is the basic context or surrounding situation uh, to the war for independence. Now, before I go to the PowerPoint and go over like different laws and then reactions to those laws, um, are there any questions? Are you guys still with me? Any thumbs up? Thumbs up, thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm glad you can still hear me. So I'm gonna move on to the PowerPoint and I'll come back to this, okay? Uh, let's see here. So let's see here. So the proclamation of 1763 uh, contended, right? Um, that the Americans could not move beyond the Appalachian Mountains, uh, that those were, were, were reserved for the Native Americans. And to a lot of Americans, right, heading west uh, was the route, was the singular uh, route to the American dream. And so now they're having it cut off by British Parliament uh, in this proclamation. Then you see the Sugar Act was passed the next year. Absentee customs officials have to return to their post. Remember, the customs officials were like the highway patrolmen who enforced the navigation laws. The navigation laws were never popular in the United States, right? Because they, uh, they, they largely um, curtailed uh, the, the, the liberties, the freedom, the rights of American merchants in particular to trade what and with whom they pleased. And so uh, the fact that they had to return to their post and do their jobs, this was seen as a, a chilling um, occurrence uh, in America. So let's see here. And then they found evidence of lots of smuggled merchandise and that confirmed Parliament and King George III's fears that we had been smuggling for quite some time. And now they're trying to crack down. Uh, official papers from merchants and ships. And um, let's see here. Uh, now uh, you have to show official papers uh, to, to, to demonstrate what you're able, what you're able to legally sell and where and to whom. And so, like I said, it's certainly not a capitalist economy. The vice admiralty courts were military naval courts that tried suspects of, uh, of for smuggling. And so their jurisdiction was extended. This was scary to American colonists. And then also there was a general writ or general uh, warrant uh, granted to the British Navy uh, to stop and inspect American ships in this Sugar Act of 1764. The number of specifically stated or enumerated goods that had a special tax put upon them was increased. So like hides, iron, timber, etc. cetera. Uh, customs duties uh, were put upon foreign cloth, sugar, indigo, coffee, and wine. And notice, right, the American, the American assemblies were not consulted. They had not given their permission as the elected reps of the colonists uh, to these taxes of goods coming in as imports. Uh, reduced duty on foreign molasses. So they actually reduced the duty on foreign molasses. Um, but still, right? Um, so look, eight assemblies uh, of, of the 13, uh, they sent petitions to the British Parliament and to King George III. Uh, contending that they this brought about too much economic injury to the colonies. And then uh, you see here, New York smugglers paraded an informer named George Spencer with human feces upon him and forced him to leave. Uh, Newport Mercury ship, there was a sword fight and the colonial person who would not abide by the customs officials demands was killed. So now the Americans are beginning to defy uh, this crackdown on the navigation laws. 
And then in 1764, also the Currency Act contended that the American colonies could not help debtors out by simply uh, printing colonial paper. So lots of economics involved as well. Colonel Isaac Barr, he gave a speech back in Parliament, and he contended, right, uh, that Americans did not see things the way the parliamentary reps were uh, articulating them when they had the floor in Parliament and were issuing the Sugar Act and these other acts. Because the Brits, right, they were contending, even some Whigs who tended to sympathize with the Americans, contended that England had supported the colonies, had subsidized the colonies, and helped them grow and to become strong as they were becoming, and that they ought not be ungrateful to Mother England, but be willing to pay the price of carrying their portion of the burden for the empire in paying taxes, whether they agreed to them or not. Isaac Barr said, I promise you, uh, Parliament, the Americans will not see it that way. They feel as if they have lifted themselves up by their own bootstraps. They have fought against Native Americans and Native American attacks without your help. Uh, they have worked and saved and, 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 and tried to hustle uh, of their own effort and their own volition, and no thanks to you, and they feel like they owe you nothing. And in fact, they feel like you are suppressing how well they could live uh, without such oppression. And so that, that speech almost proved to be a bit prophetic. Uh, the Virginia House of Burgesses is the assembly. That's the title of their assembly. They're elected colonial reps. They issued five or four, I think it was initially five and cut down to four uh, resolutions. And 29-year-old Patrick Henry became famous uh, amidst this process where he contended, right, uh, the, the, um, according to the press, give me liberty or give me death. And what he did is he issued a slippery slope argument contending that in the past, Americans had paid had had given the consent for their own taxes through or via uh, their elected reps in the assemblies. Now the government is taking this away. And what was going to happen is this was gonna start a slippery slope. So if they took away one right of the colonists uh, today, they would surely take something else away from them tomorrow. And so that hence, you know, it, it's crazy now to think of it, perhaps, but the notion of paying just a very, very negligible tax uh, on some commodities, but without their permission, right? And it, it can, it, it's hard not to look like hyperbole, right? Like strategic, deliberate exaggeration, um, reading this stuff. But Patrick Henry, George Washington, and others contended that they will make slaves of us by doing this. It seems like they're jumping from zero to a thousand, right? In a quick jump, like, wait a minute, you're just paying a couple, uh, you know, just a pence, not even a penny uh, on your tea or on your sugar. And, um, and you're, you're becoming enslaved in your own eyes, or you're going to become enslaved. But remember, that was, the, that was going along with the ideas of the French and the Scottish Enlightenments, especially the Scottish, the libertarian one. The idea that, that governments will take away rights incrementally, that they're no dummies, they're not going to do anything blatant, uh, lest the people rise in rebellion, but they're going to be subtle, they're going to be gradual uh, in their usurpation of 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 the rights of enjoyed by the subjects or the citizens. So it, it's the principle of it, according to Patrick Henry. Rhode Island's assembly uh, deemed, uh, I'm sorry, now we're talking about the Stamp Act. And the Stamp Act is no longer an external tax on uh, imports. This is an internal domestic tax 
that is demanded of the colonists for anything that involved the printing of paper. And so uh, the Rhode Island Assembly declared it to be unconstitutional. Uh, let's see here. And then in Massachusetts, a lot of people became angry because James Otis had a chance. He kind of waffled, um, uh, whereby at first he was greatly against the usurpation of American right to give their permission themselves to their own taxes by way of their assemblies. But when push came to shove at this moment in history, he backed down and stated that an act by parliament is, must be uh, obeyed and not defied. And so, um, so when he submitted and refused to uh, take a stand against the Stamp Act, a lot of people were angry uh, toward him as a judge. And Hutchinson, um, Hutchinson became a hated English figure in Massachusetts, but he had written a private letter to the governor, Bernard of Massachusetts, telling him, you need to have a crackdown, basically, that if you need to take away, abrogate some of the rights of the citizens momentarily to make a statement and to get them, to scare them into submission, then now's the time to do it. And that letter became publicized uh, through people like uh, Benjamin Franklin, who got a hold of it. And so um, Massachusetts was in arms. Um, the Stamp Act Congress, nine uh, assemblymen from nine states met in the Stamp Act Congress and declared that uh, you could only be taxed by the consent of your assembly, and they would not recognize any other such taxes. Uh, then at this time, that was the legal voice, right? That was the conduit through which the voice of the people could be heard was through the elected assemblymen. Now, extra legal or outside the government institutions, uh, extra legal uh, bodies and fraternities began becoming established. And most famous of them arguably were the Sons of Liberty chapters. And now you're talking about, you know, uh, supposedly, according to Gordon S. Wood, uh, middle class merchants and artisans, skilled workers. So they're laborers and traders uh, who make a modest uh, income, but they're doing well enough and independently enough on their own that it supposedly enhances their collective self esteem and their sense of entitlement as to what they felt felt American citizens or subjects under Great Britain ought to be entitled to. And so to him, this was a sign of grassroots uh, passion for this war, that when you look at the sons and daughters of Liberty chapters, et cetera, it, to him, that's evidence that this was a popular war. And that's very argumentative. So they engaged in a boycott, right, whereby they refused to buy British goods that were taxed without the assembly's consent. There were some mob riots. And so the Whig majority in parliament dropped the taxes and they issued the Declaratory Act in response, however, and saying in the future, if it's not clear by English common law, parliament virtually represents the American colonists, maybe not literally, because the American colonists didn't vote in the parliamentary members, right? But that they, they represent them because they are of the same demographics. They have the same demographics in parliament. So notice, uh, like I said, artisans, skilled workers was a big class numerically. So there were artisans who were elected into parliament, farmers, cash crop farmers uh, elected into parliament. Um, subsistence farmers just growing their own food, very few, but they had some elected reps who at least had begun as subsistence farmers and so forth. So they, they said, hence, you are virtually represented by parliament. We do not need the colonial assembly's permission, but parliament alone has the right to dictate uh, laws and taxes. So then they tried another external tax on imports known as the Townsend Act, named after Robert Townsend, um, a, a couple of years later. Uh, 
so lead, paint, glass, tea, etc. And they sent troops to the coastal cities. And to a lot of people, boy, in the primary sources, this was a big deal. I mean, just imagine, you know, um, uh, it's difficult to imagine being controlled and under the sovereignty of a, another, uh, you know, political entity and country separate from ours, as was the case here under England. But imagine English troops coming all the way into your neighborhood and walking up and down your street with the uniforms and the guns and so forth, that it was unsettling. It was unnerving. And, and again, the Scottish libertarians, they always they were huge on what would later become the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, saying don't trust government, especially when government throws its weight around militarily, that it's not to be trusted. You need to arm yourself. You need to be ready at a minute's notice to defend your family and defend your neighborhood and defend your rights, even if it's from your own government and your own military, hence the term Minutemen uh, during this war um, for the militiamen of the states that fought against England. And so um, vice admiralty courts, again, those were like the military courts. They were moved to cities like Philadelphia, Boston, and Charleston, where a lot of the smuggling was, was rampant. And now this was arguably to make a statement, to scare the colonists, to try these smugglers right in front of their, their constituents, their people, their neighbors. So uh, John Hancock's ship was captured and confiscated. His stuff was confiscated because John Hancock became rich off of smuggling. Uh, Sam Adams wrote a circular to the colonies from Massachusetts. And this circular called for some type of agency that would unite the 13 assemblies of the 13 colonies and to uh, basically to share information, uh, to apprise one another of what was going on in one colony so that colonies far away would, would learn of it. And of course, when I mean what was going on, I mean negative things, right? Uh, different ways in which the British might be curtailing their freedoms and their rights. They wanted everyone to know, and they wanted to have some form of collaboration. Remember, England had given its consent to the assemblies, not to anything else like this. So they were given a demand by the royal governor of Massachusetts to rescind this movement, this circular being sent to all the other colonies, and they refused. By a vote of 92 to 17, they passed it anyway. And so now you have the boycott, like with the Daughters of Liberty. You have mob violence stepping it up. You can't see it here, but there's a guy tarred and feathered uh, in this picture right here behind the, the names. Um, so the Massachusetts Assembly was dissolved. Two regiments were sent from Ireland into Boston. Uh, the New York Assembly was dissolved. Remember, that's their state voice, and now it's dissolved by British Parliament and, and, and approved by the Crown, George III. Um, let's see here. So then the new prime minister, Lord North, he repealed these taxes and kept only one, the one on T. And you know what's going to happen. Uh, Boston, uh, the Boston Massacre uh, began over a fist fight between a colonist and a soldier. The colonist supposedly got the better of him, and the soldier came back to his barracks, and the other soldiers had seen what had happened. They were furious, came back for revenge, chased the young man uh, to a gentleman named Brooks. Uh, I think it was, I want to say Preston Brooks. And uh, the young man ran actually to the garrison. Uh, uh, knowing that Preston Brooks would show him mercy and protect him, the colonist, uh, from Preston Brooks' own soldiers underneath him. And uh, while they were trying, Mr. Brooks was trying to find out what the heck was going on, a crowd surrounded them, began throwing rocks and snowballs and saying profane things to the soldiers. And to this day, no one knows if an order was or was not given 
but the soldiers shot into the crowd and killed five people. And so then pamphlets just took off, right? Pamphlets were anywhere from 13 to like 35 pages. So they were palatable. They were just short enough that the average person could take the time to read them. Uh, John Dickinson, James Otis, Sam Adams, Thomas Paine, John Adams uh, began writing just thousands of pamphlets that began uh, disseminating throughout the colonies. All right. Um, let's see here. And look at this. The committees of correspondence were established despite the threats of the Massachusetts governor. And the, and the committees of correspondence not only united the assemblies from the different colonies, but also united them with the Sons of Liberty chapters. So to some people, right, this is evidence again of the popularity of the rebellion, how now you're getting not only the cream of the crop assemblymen who are protesting, but and you're not only get the common people in the streets, like in Boston with the mob violence, uh, attacking tax collectors and so forth uh, going, but you also have the, uh, the middling sector of, of well-to-do working class or lower middle class people that form the Sons of Liberty chapters joining in with them. To other people, they think it was Sam Adams and others clever way of hijacking this movement and ensuring that the, the well-to-do assemblymen could control the rebellion and lead it and not the common folk in the mobs uh, that, were, that were rioting and not even the, um, the more well-to-do workers of the Sons of Liberty chapters. So there's difference of opinion as to what that really signifies, uh, the committees of correspondence. And then in 1773, the Tea Act was passed. It gave the English East India Company a monopoly on selling tea to the colonies. So on December 16th, dressed, disguised as Native Americans, the local Sons of Liberty chapter of Boston came and dumped 10,000 shillings worth of tea into Boston Harbor. And now the English are not playing around. Uh, their prime minister, both houses of parliament, as well as uh, King George III. Uh, they issued the Coercive Acts of 1774. Boston Harbor was closed. Uh, the uh, town hall meetings were closed. Now there's no representative democracy at all in Massachusetts. Vice Admiralty Courts were sent overseas, uh, but those judges and the vice admiralty courts and the English judges had could claim extraterritoriality. So if they broke an American law, they would be sent back to England. And the idea was is that they would just get a slap on the wrist back in England and that they were above the law here in the US. The Quebec Act gave freedom of religion and certain citizenship rights to French Catholics in Canada. And to a lot of Americans, uh, I mean, there's evidence to suggest that Parliament was trying to make a contrast here and try to show the American colonies, see, if you would just collaborate with us, we will be accommodating with you. Look how well we're treating the French Catholics of Quebec. Uh, but instead, it smacked of notions to Americans and the pamphlets, etc. It smacked of the notion of, of almost conspiracy theory, that they were trying to um, oppress and, and enslave Americans, and they were, they were putting it in their nose, treating the French Catholics so well uh, of Canada. Uh, Continental Congress uh, met in September of 1774, and that's when the expression, the die is cast by Benjamin Franklin, was issued. They uh, articulated enlightenment notions, oppositional philosophers, uh, Christian Christianity and classical antiquity. We'll get more into that in a moment. So then in Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, uh, the, um, the Minutemen uh, were meeting and training because the governors had given ultimatums to their state militias. 
um, telling them, and George Washington had to face this dilemma as well, saying, okay, we're at so at odds with the assemblies, and they're beginning to illegally meet without our permission. Um, you either are for us um, or you're against us. And so uh, they split, right? The militiamen split. Some stayed loyal to their royal governors and some left and became Minutemen. And, you know, John Adams, his famous uh, approximation, I, I have yet to see it refuted. Uh, not to say that it is impeccably accurate, but I've not read from one of the real serious historians anything on the contrary. As he surmised that about a third of the Americans were very ardently pro rebellion, a third of them uh, were very uh, loyal to England as loyalists, and about a third of them seemed to be indifferent or, or unwilling to pick a side. So just food for thought. So at any rate, uh, the word was told that some of the ringleaders, the intellectual ringleaders amongst the assemblymen, et cetera, were meeting uh, in Concord and that they were accumulating an army. And so uh, the British um, sent soldiers to go and capture them, arrest them and confiscate their military um, you know, uh, their, their, their military supplies. On their way there, they were met and stopped at Lexington by a very motley group of Minutemen. And for, uh, again, no one knows who fired the first shot, but when the British fired, they killed about 13 uh, American soldiers and began marching to Concord. They're only minutes away from capturing a couple of the future founding fathers who narrowly escaped. And on their way back, they were mercilessly shot at uh, by American um, Minutemen on their way back to Boston. And so by this time, the Second Continental Congress met in May of 1775, and they, uh, they began raising an army, put Wa George Washington at the head of it, uh, en engaged in diplomatic overtures to France and other countries for help, and um, it didn't take long. Well, actually, it did take a while. Um, it took a year uh, to issue a Declaration of Independence. All right, so moving on to the argumentative assignment. Are there any questions? Any questions or comments? Okay, so number one, look for evidence of the colonists defying mercantilist restrictions economically, trading with whom they pleased, not abiding by the navigation laws, the British not supporting or enforcing those navigation laws very effectively for various reasons. Then look for evidence of American colonists politically accruing more and more power for themselves prior to the war for independence. Remember, under English common law, once an assembly begins giving its permission to tax, English common law goes by precedent. So they say, hey, it was established back in 1664 we give our consent to taxes. That's part of English common law now, it, that it evolves organically. And it did, at least back in England. So then at the end of the French and Indian War, right, dad comes home in the form of Great Britain. Dad comes home and says, hey, wait a minute, son or daughter, you haven't abided by any of my rules. Now you're going to. And basically the son or daughter says, sorry, dad, too little, too late. I'm doing too well for myself. I'm not giving up a good thing. So number one can be found from what I understand in England proper, in England itself, 
their oftentimes their interpretation to our rebellion against them. That we're spoiled ingrates. We did as we pleased for quite some time. And when they tried to crack down on us, we weren't having it. And we fought to keep a good thing going. Number two, court history. America as a special, exceptional nation. So the role of the Enlightenment. I'm sorry if this is getting frustrating for you, but I'm going to move back to the PowerPoint. Enlightenment. John Locke and his second treatise on government. Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his book, Social Contract. The idea, right, surmising about the first governments that were established. They surmised that in a state of nature, man lived free, completely autonomous. But man being who he is, some of them ultimately abused that freedom. And they stepped upon the natural rights of other people. And by natural rights, I mean rights that you are entitled to by God by virtue of being a human being born in the universe. Okay, pardon me. So, let's say we get marooned on an island as a class. We go to an, uh, you know, on a trip and we, uh, there's a wreck and we somehow survive it and we're, we're stuck on an island and we all start in a state of nature, each man and woman for him or herself. But then before you know it, people, a group, it might be a small, it might be a moderately larger uh, size group, start stealing people's cell phones, forcing them to fish and hunt for them and to cook food for them, um, began threatening and harming other people. So we've had enough. And we do a cost benefit analysis. And we say, okay, we love our complete freedom and having no authority above us. But we hate the fact of how precarious we feel here in the state of nature, because none of us feel safe with our life, our liberty, or our property. So therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to relinquish some of that freedom in favor of improving this side, of improving our, our rights to our life, liberty, and property. So we will begrudgingly allow and choose for ourselves a government to rule, but those governing people that we choose in our class are not our rulers to a large extent. They're our servants. And so we're going to have them protect, that's their sole job, is to protect our lives, our liberty, and our property. And if they should fail to do such, we have the right to nullify the treaty with them and elect new group of people who will the right of revolution. So that was surmised by Locke and Rousseau known as the idea of the social contract. And if that was the case in which the first government ostensibly was established, the enlightenment was all about sticking with natural laws because the enlightenment was kind of deistic. Uh, the idea that, that there was a God that's like a great clockmaker and everything works by mechanical laws, including the laws of human interaction. And human beings were born free, Rousseau said, and meant to be born free, as free as they will allow themselves to be. Diderot and Condorcet, they wrote the encyclopedia, and they were all about the right of self-cultivation, that they were against the idea of only the elite 
could have access to knowledge. They wanted to democratize learning. So they would have been very impressed by the internet and its kind of egalitarian effect on learning. In my humble estimation, I think they are a part of Thomas Jefferson's notion of the pursuit of happiness. That's just me. Voltaire was all about expression and tolerance. One of his followers, a well-to-do woman, contended at one time, I disagree with what you're saying, but I defend to the death your right to say it. Voltaire was an iconoclast, kind of like South Park. Whatever was considered sacred at his time period, he tore into and made fun of, etc., on principle. Beccaria, he was about the right, the natural rights enjoyed by everyone that's accused of being uh, guilty of a crime for suspects. Adam Smith wrote his Wealth and Poverty of Nations and the individual's right to economic liberty and, and autonomy. Wollstonecraft wrote about rights for women. All right. The Scottish Enlightenment, they distrusted anyone having too much power. They were huge on Montesquieu's book, Spirit of the Laws, checks and balances, right, that we're all familiar with, that term. Having separate branches with checks and powers over one another. Having written constitutions that limit, prescribe what the government can and cannot do regarding the rights of its citizens. Keep government decentralized and small. And again, they were worried about tyranny by small increments. And they had a famous letter, a famous newspaper, Cato's Letters. Guys named Trenchard and Gord, Gordon. And they put together these ideas, the ideas of the French Enlightenment, with events that were going on in England. And they were trying to warn the English people that George III in particular and parliament were becoming oppressive and corrupt. And that they were only gonna lead England on a slippery slide whereby things were only gonna get worse unless the people stood up. Cato's letters, by the way, were read here in our columns. Christianity, the Great Awakening, was for conditional deference. I'll try to hurry this up, okay? I know it's been well over an hour. Um, conditional deference. Knowing your place and respecting your superiors, but only if they themselves are following God. Because if they begin living disobediently, then you have the right as their parishioners to defy them. So going back to the handout. These ideas come from France, Scotland, the Great Awakening here in the colonies and England. And the leisure class of Americans like Thomas Jefferson, Dickinson, Adams, Franklin, 
They had the time, the education, the money to buy books about these intellectual movements, read them, ruminate on them, and summarize them in short, simple form. They summarized them in pamphlets. Like I said, that sometimes were only 13 pages long to 35. In newspaper articles. And in doing so, they served as midwives, right, who helped give birth of an idea from one world to the next. They served as intellectual midwives of giving birth to these ideas to the common people, says Bernard Balin. So that the common people became educated, became enlightened by way of these intellectual leaders. So here I am talking about Montesquieu and his spirit of the laws and checks and balances. And even I as an instructor have not actually read that book. After this lecture, after reading a little bit from uh, uh, Gordon Wood's book, you could describe to another peer, another student, very likely, uh, the notion of the social contract without necessarily having read Jean-Jacques Rousseau's book, Etc. So the average citizen became enlightened. And we fought for those lofty ideals. So it doesn't matter that those taxes were such a pittance in amount. It was the principle. It was a larger principle we were supposedly fighting for. Number three, look for evidence of George Washington being selfish and ambitious and being, being angry that he couldn't climb the British ladder as highly as he had anticipated and hoped. So one's left wondering after reading this biography, well, man, if Washington had achieved his ambitions, would he have even joined the rebellion, much less led it? Food for thought. But Washington felt like the system of patronage the authority, the right, the power of political leaders to judge for whom and to whom they would allot certain circumstances and positions. To him, that system was unfair and illogical. Because to him, right, he who ought to receive the position, he who ought to receive the opportunity should be he who deserves or earns it is the most capable. And he felt like he was one of those people and was being short shrifted by the British. So maybe some of his fighting in the war for independence amounted to sour grapes. All right, so this is Joseph Ellis on George Washington. And then number four, Howard Zinn. 
contends that what may have evolved into a people's war against the well-to-do. Notice I didn't say the British, but the well-to-do, period, was hijacked by the American well-to-do who used the British as a convenient scapegoat and deflected the poor American people's anger away from themselves and toward the British so that they might avoid the wrath of the mobs and might become the most powerful man standing after the British were kicked out. Very cynical thesis by Howard Zinn. And he finds there's evidence of this before the war, as I mentioned before, in the case of poor commoners complaining against their well-to-do parasitical elected assemblymen, lack of enthusiasm during the war and for the war on behalf of the common people, because according to Howard Zinn, the common people didn't see this as their fight. They knew the well-to-do, the future founding fathers at George Washington had their own agenda. Very cynical thesis. And hence why the well-to-do leading the Continental Army and Continental Congress had to use the proverbial carrot and the stick to keep Americans fighting this war. The carrot and promising a better country to the common people, promising land and payment for their service in the armed forces. And the stick, quite draconian punishments against mutiny and disobedience in the armed forces. And at times, um, almost barbaric harshness uh, toward Tories. All right, so are there any other questions? Any questions about numbers one through four? Any questions about any of the, the test questions? You still there? Did I bore you to death? Still here. Good, thank you, Anthony. All right, you guys. Well, that's all I have. All righty. Thank you for the lecture, Mr. Cowell. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate your gratitude. I really do. All right. So you guys have a great week, okay? All right. Thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Bye-bye.